Hi, everybody. I am Stephanie Patrick, executive editor of Adweek, and you are tuning in for our second episode of Adweek Together. Uh, we are broadcasting this live on adweek.com, as well as LinkedIn. And afterward, you'll be able to see it on IGTV as well. I'm looking at LinkedIn, and I can see we have people from Dubai, Los Angeles, UK, Bolivia, Fort Worth, Texas, Chicago, so Finland, a lot of people in the house. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, what is the show? Why are we doing this? So right now we have 50 journalists who are dispersed across the tri-state area and the country. And we know that you are our readers and our viewers are dispersed all over the world. Many of us working in our homes right now. And we wanted to create a space every day where we can come together and talk about what's happening in the industry and how each of our uh, each section of our industry is sort of responding to the coronavirus uh, crisis and sort of the the economic implications of that. So super happy today to have Kelsey Sutton. So she's our streaming editor at Adweek, and she's here with me today to talk all about streaming and TV. No no shortage of news there. I think she's been the busiest person in our newsroom, <laughs> frankly, the last couple of weeks. Uh, so Kelsey, thank you so much for for joining us. Where where are you, by the way? Uh, I am at my kitchen table in Astoria, <laughs> New York, um, which I've been here, I guess, for the last week and a half uh, and will be for the uh, foreseeable future, I suppose. But uh, it's good to it's always good to have uh, Zoom calls and, and things like this where I can see, you know, my colleagues faces and uh, remember what you all look like <laughs> while we're working remote. Absolutely. So um, and I'll, I'll say, too, to those of you watching on LinkedIn, if you have a question for Kelsey, feel free to drop it in the comments. And uh, if I if I see it, I'll try to um, I'll try to put that question to her. So, but Kelsey, to start, I mean, um, this is a bit of a no brainer for me to say this, but um, a lot of people are watching TV right now, right? And a lot of people <laughs> are tuning into streaming services. Can you give us a sense of um, how viewership has changed for the streaming services? How much more TV are people watching? Yeah, so um, we got some numbers yesterday, actually provided by HBO, which put out some. They put out some some gains about some of the particular programming that that they've seen increases in um, in viewership. But overall, we're seeing about a twenty percent increase in in TV viewing, and that's on traditional uh, linear platforms, uh, and it's on streaming. Uh, so it's really, I mean, it's like you said, it's not really surprising that as people are sort of uh, told to stay home uh, or are, you know, avoiding or, or are, make, you know, making the decision to stay home uh, because of everything that's going on, that they are, are watching TV. And it's particularly interesting because if people are not going to work, uh, you know, if whether they have a laptop in front of them or not, there's sort of an, you know, there's, there's the additional time of people watching TV during the day. So daytime viewership uh, is also up. So it's really just kind of growth across the board. Um, and and uh, it's really just kind of an interesting time for, for the industry because it's gonna kind of amplify, uh, it's gonna amplify opportunities uh, for streaming services um, and video on demand. Um, but it's also kind of a, an immediate uptick for, for linear television and, we've sort of seen that downward trend for years of for viewership but even that is seeing a, a boost right now just because everyone is sort of stuck in their living rooms and looking for for something to do to entertain themselves and i know you know before uh coronavirus hit um you were writing a lot just about the streaming wars those those have were really heating up this year how is this impacting that do you think uh, does this change the game in terms of the projected winners and losers in the streaming uh, the streaming world? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, it's really, it depends on the kind of streamer that uh, these companies are trying to build. Something that I think is going to be really interesting that we see over time is uh, sort of the value of uh, the library of programming. Uh, we've seen basically a complete halt in production in Hollywood. And of course, that's to be expected, right? You can't have groups of huge groups of people working on shows. And that's already affecting uh, some release dates for some uh, uh, finales uh, on, on broadcast. Um, and what that means is 
where are you going to direct viewers if you can't put out a new episode? You want to direct them into your catalog of content. And so I think that this really, this moment in particular, and in the months ahead, uh, as we see sort of the ripple effects of ceasing production today and what that means, you know, months in the future, because these shows don't happen overnight, as you know. Uh, it's going to be really important for streamers, I think, to to point people to to the library and say, here, look, here we have all of this content. It might not be brand new, but hey, it's something to tide you over uh, as we're kind of figuring out what the new normal is, and, and people are trying to figure out, you know, again, <laughs> how to entertain themselves uh, in you know this this sort of uh, very strange time uh, for for a lot of Americans. Yeah, that's interesting what you're saying on the production side because I hadn't necessarily thought of that. I think everyone is thinking, oh, this is you know, a real opportunity for streamers, but many of them have been pushing original content. And so are you saying that there are some shows where they're just not able to film the finale because people can't get together right now? That's exactly right. So uh, the fourth season of Fargo, which is on FX, and now FX is on Hulu. So that's the this, this streaming uh, hook there. Um, they are gonna have to delay their the release of their fourth season because they didn't finish the last two episodes. Uh, they hadn't finished producing them. So so that's, you know, that's one effect, but we also, are seeing that with, I believe, The Walking Dead and with uh, Supernatural, uh, sort of this pause on the finales because they uh, they just can't make it happen. Something that's kind of interesting is we look at the new streamers. And so we have sort of a, a three new streaming services that are kind of ramping up and getting ready to, to, to launch. And uh, they all have said, you know, uh, so, so the three are Quibi, which is short form mobile video uh, coming from Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman. Uh, then we have uh, HBO Max, which is coming from Warner Media. Uh, and then we have Peacock, which is coming from NBC Universal. And uh, mm. so I talked to uh, I, I talked to Whistle, which produces shows for Quibi, and they produce shows for a lot of places, but they have several shows for Quibi. And what they said is, it's really uh, because that launch is April sixth is sort of the planned launch. A lot of their pro a lot of their production has already been finalized. So that mm. is kind of a you know, a moment of relief for them because they're so close to launch. Um, but services like HBO Max have already had to, uh, they had this big Friends reunion special, which they were going to bring the cast of Friends, the sitcom, uh, all back together, and they had not gone into production. So they're mm. having to delay that production, they're hoping to still launch in May with that. But that really remains to be seen because we don't know what the next few months are going to look like? And is it going to be possible to bring a lot of people together to actually film something like that? So there mm. are going to be effects um, kind of down the line. It really just kind of depends on how this all plays out and what sort of restrictions there are and how people are, what people are comfortable with, I think too, mm. uh, in terms of getting back together and, and filming things and, and putting these, these sorts of shows uh, together. Yeah, and the timeline is so un unknown right now, which I'm sure makes it difficult on the marketing end. Um, speaking about that side of it, I'm just wondering what you're seeing in terms of marketing tactics from the streamers. We've talked about the fact that it's a there's there's an opportunity for them here, but I'm guessing that they have to be careful in how they communicate that. Are you seeing uh, any you know blatant <laughs> marketing tactics? People are saying you know you're staying at home because of coronavirus by our service. Is it more subtle? Are they even mentioning it at all? Yeah, so I haven't seen anything to the sort of specific uh, your home because of coronavirus. And, and I actually talked to uh, Tubi's chief revenue officer uh, earlier today, and he said that really there is this line to, to walk. You have to, you want people to be aware of your service, but you don't want to have any messaging uh, different. And they actually have not changed uh, what they are doing in terms of marketing to uh, to people. They're, they're uh, you know, ad supported and free. So they want people to, to know that it's an option. But uh, he said that they haven't really changed their trajectory. But you have seen, and I, I, uh, this was some, for some data that Brand Total gave to me. Uh, and uh, they're, a, they're a measurement firm and they look at uh, sponsored impressions across various social platforms. And they have seen um, a slight uptick um, in sponsored impressions from some of the streamers. Um, what the, uh, I guess, whether that was planned or whether that's a more recent development um, is, you know, remains to, it, it kind of, the streamers will have to confirm what that 
is, right? And maybe they had planned yeah. an uptick in, you know, for, for months and uh, it just happens to coincide with these, these last couple of weeks. But uh, there's definitely, I think, an opportunity that people recognize um, when people are home, when people are have much more free time in the home than they're used to having, uh, there is certainly an opportunity to get in front of the right people. Uh, and so that's what brand total saw is is a little bit of an uptick um, on some some platforms like Instagram and uh, and YouTube in particular uh, for some streamers, um, whether they're ad supported, whether they're subscription only, uh, a hybrid model. Um, so it's really, it's, it's interesting. And it's something that's, I, I want to mention too, is, uh, transactional video on demand. So that's, if you are a service that provides pay per view, I'm going to pay, uh, for 48 hours, I can watch a movie, um, or maybe I'm going to pay $20 and I can buy a movie and have it digitally to stream immediately. They're seeing a big opportunity too, because a lot of, uh, film distributors are, if they were putting out a, a movie in theaters right now, uh, obviously no one can go <laughs> or very few people will go. So, so the, the thinking from some of these studios, including Universal Pictures, um, including Disney, is to make uh, some of these films available to buy or to rent much, much sooner than they normally would. And Universal mm -hmm. Pictures said last week, actually, we're going to make it available the same day as the global theatrical release that you can rent it or buy or you can buy it in your in your home um and so there's an opportunity for for those companies too to sort of i guess pivot yeah. uh and focus on another way to to get their films in in front of uh in front of viewers no matter you know no matter <laughs> if it's in <laughs> theaters or if it's in a living room you know they they uh are doing whatever they can Right. Uh, no, it's interesting. And just anecdotally, uh, uh, along the lines of marketing on, on social and social impressions, um, my, uh, my preschooler school closed like 15 days ago. It was one of the first schools to close in New York. And I posted something on Instagram stories about looking for ways to entertain my kid and almost immediately was served a Disney Plus ad. And it was the first time I'd ever been served a Disney Plus ad. So um, I can see that too, just with so many um, kids being out of school, uh, this really being um, a bonus if you're a streaming service that has a lot of kids content. And I've seen a lot of them offering their content for free or at reduced prices. Mm -hmm. I think Amazon just freed up all of its Peppa Pig episodes, which yep. my son is super happy about. <laughs> so <laughs> some interesting tactics there in terms of pricing as well. Absolutely. And there's also an opportunity to maybe not change your, your marketing messaging, but extend a free trial, uh, which we've already seen from quite a number of streamers. And like you said, putting some stuff in front of the paywall. So Amazon did that with a lot of kids content, which I think a lot of parents are probably breathing a sigh of relief uh, that they can get Dan Daniel Tiger or Peppa Pig in front of their kids. Um, but uh, Apple TV uh, is putting out actually a, a series with Oprah. Uh, they struck a deal with Oprah, I think in 2018. Um, and so it's Oprah Talks COVID-19. And so she's put out two episodes so far, one with Idris Elba uh, and his wife talking about, you know, being uh, in self-isolation uh, after getting uh, tested positive for it. Uh, and then another one with a, with a pastor uh, to kind of talk about what this sort of how this is kind of affecting the way people think about uh, their lives and faith and, and everything like that. And that's also free. Um, and Apple TV Plus does not put uh, their shows in front of the paywall. You have to pay $4.99 a month to access their content, but they made an exception for this. Um, I, again, it's an, an, inter an interesting strategy. It's kind of, um, you don't want to be seen as, I, I think the thinking is you don't want to be seen as sort of, capitalizing in a way that feels, you know, un, un, you know, just distasteful, I guess. So there are mm -hmm. sort of opportunities here, like how do you, how do you strike that balance? How do you figure out how to give people what they want and uh, build a little goodwill while you're, while you're doing it? Absolutely. I, you know, while you're here, I want to ask you about um, advertising spend and just what you and your team are hearing from media buyers. I know this isn't directly your beat, but you work very closely with Jason Lynch, who is Adweek's TV editor. What are you guys here? What is the outlook right now for um, for ad spend? 
Yeah, so I think that the last couple of weeks have been a lot of uh, regrouping, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of trying to figure out day to day, like what is actually happening? What does this look like? Uh, not just in the next week, but in a couple months. And that's really hard to tell. Um, but I think for the broadcasters, and this is something that, that Jason has written about um, at length and will continue to write about at length, but um, a lot of broadcasters have these live sports uh, big t tentpole events. And clearly that has been really disrupted because the NBA canceled um, their, their season. So March Madness is off the table, um, some early MLB uh, is off the table. So it's just, it's no live sports means that buyers are having to figure out new strategies. And for them, that's either meant pushing buys later. So gonna wait until those leagues return and we're just gonna kind of kick the can down the road and wait for, for that to come back or shifting buys kind of immediately into other inventory that the broadcasters offer. Um, nothing can really replace March Madness in terms of impact or engagement. So it's really kind of a, figuring out where, what's the best strategy here? What's the best use of, of our money? So some of them are also saying, just actually give us our money back. We're gonna kind of regroup, figure out what to do. Um, and several brands have also had to change their messaging, right? Like we, we have mm. uh, already seen some of these PSAs from brands, uh, kind of going out about social distancing and various things, but you can't run an ad about, um, you know, hugging people or, um, you know, licking your fingers after eating food, because obviously that resonates in a very different way than when that creative was, was made. And um, so it's really, I think that what we're seeing right now is in the short term, travel and automotive are um, really just like stepping back from from the mm. ad buys. Um, theatrical as well, like I said, when you have, when you can't drive people to go to a theater, um, you're not gonna run an ad <laughs> for for yeah. the movie that you have in theaters. Um, and we've also seen some theatrical releases just being pushed for an entire year, which means whatever they were gonna spend um, in terms of advertising on, on television is, is you know, there's, they've pressed pause on that. Um, yeah. And then retail as well, right? It's hard to, um, you, there's sort of this pivot, I think, uh, you have to, how do you shift it to e-commerce messaging? Is advertising on television still the best way to direct people to e-commerce? Or does that make more sense on digital, right? So these are all kind of questions that that uh, that companies are grappling with. Um, when I talked to Tubi, uh, Chief Revenue Officer Mark Rotblatt earlier today, he said that uh, they've definitely seen there's still interest and even a, a, a growing interest from delivery services, which of course, you know, when you hear that, you go, right. of course, of course that's happening. Um, and so you're also seeing restaurants that have a delivery component. Um, Chipotle is a good example of that, like that they're sort of pivoting their messaging to focus on delivery because again, you don't want people coming to your restaurants when your doors are closed uh, due to a, you know, a local government decree. So. Um, it's really, I think it, a lot of it is waiting and see, trying to figure out this short-term plan, but because the future is so sort of up in the air right now, I think that the, the long-term plans are, are much, much harder uh, to, yeah. to plan out. And so it's really going to be a wait and see as, as we see these shifts um, and, and we figure out what the new normal is. And Kelsey, um, before we close, I want to take one question from LinkedIn. So this is from Kimberly Cody Waterhouse. She said she would love some input on the growth of OTT and how traditional broadcast still has value. Um, any thoughts from you on, you know, uh, the value of OTT versus traditional broadcast at a time like this? Yeah, I mean, I think that broadcast has always done a very good job of drawing really I guess, big, big engagement numbers, right? Like there's nothing like a March Madness or something yeah. like to that, you know, these big tentpole events that drive live viewership. Um, and that's really valuable uh, for, for broadcasters. I think the challenge right now is when you don't have those sort of live tentpole events or you can't do, I mean, some broadcasters have done live sitcoms, the Connors have done a live episode, you know, how you, you can't do that right now in this exact moment. 
But I think that's sort of the always the the thinking about the strength there is just the the sort of size of, of audience and the the ability for for impact there. I think that as we move, as people continue to watch on demand, the the value for a lot of the OTT space is a little bit more uh, a little bit more targeted capabilities, um, and that's kind of again this big industry question of advanced TV and figuring out how to um, sort of meet in the middle and figure out a, a way that that kind of traditional uh, linear can can kind of work uh, in in a, a space where where marketers have that appetite. Um, I think that it's it's as you see kind of growth in viewership right now in this moment and you see it particularly on connected devices um, and that's something that um, HBO said said yesterday they're seeing a lot of growth on connected devices in terms of viewership. Uh, the opportunities there are how do I how do we reach the right people? Um, you know what sort of platform? What's what is available um, in terms of inventory? But as we know, so much of, of viewing uh, in the streaming space is not ad supported. So it's figuring yeah. out the right places to do it um, and how do you shift your strategy uh, in terms of messaging, in terms of the ad formats, all that. Um, so that that's a it's a question that I'm that everybody's thinking about. But I think that this moment sort of only accelerates that challenge of figuring out the balance because these consumer habits are shifting so fast in such an you know unusual time. So is it a short term shift? Is it a long term shift? Like when will things will things go back to normal? Or what yeah. is sort of the new the new normal after this sort of accelerated, I think, move uh, into yeah. into the on demand space? Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest stories that we are covering across our beats, and will be really interesting um, in the weeks and months ahead. Is which of these shifts that we're experiencing right now um, are going to be lasting? Because I think some will, some will, some will flip back to normal, but but others won't. Um, and, and in some cases that's for the better, it's because you know innovation is happening uh, during a time of crisis. So Kimberly, thank you uh, for weighing in with that question. Um, Kelsey, thanks for answering it. Um, final thing, a, a note I wanna end on, since you're from our TV team, um, as we are all doing more live video and video conferencing, do you have a tip uh, for people on how to improve um, their own video that they're recording you know, from their homes or makeshift offices? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, but my setup right now is uh, one, I'm as far away at, from my radiator as possible so that if it goes off, I am no, it hopefully does not disrupt the sound. Um, and I actually have a light. It's a, um, it's a light therapy box that my mom sent me for, it's usually used for light therapy for seasonal affective disorder which actually makes a great light. So I have that right behind my computer uh, to sort of light it up. We, who knows if it's <laughs> a good move, but I'm trying my best. I think we're all trying our best. Um, Dual purpose. I think, I think we could use some happiness and some good lighting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially on a dreary day like this. I'm doing everything I can. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, uh, I'm not a video expert, but my tip would be, uh, I actually attended a webinar about working from home last week and the host recommended, um, you know, putting on like earrings or putting gel in your hair or doing like those personal grooming things that signal to your brain, I'm giving a presentation or I'm going to work or I'm going into an important meeting. I'm doing those even though you're from home. So I put a necklace on for you today, Kelsey. Oh, there I'm actually you go. wearing <laughs> I'm wearing nice shoes. You wouldn't see them, but I know they're there. <laughs> ah, that's <laughs> smart. In the right frame of mind. Um, so anyway, those are our tips for you today. Um, Kelsey, again, <laughs> thanks thanks for being here. I appreciate your your deep insights on the streaming world. Um, be sure to, you know, to all of our viewers, be sure to check out um, Kelsey's stories on adweek.com. She is writing a ton uh, every day. And thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Adweek Together. Um, we will be back here tomorrow at about one o'clock, uh, both on adweek.com and LinkedIn, talking about retail. So looking forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.